Alright, round nine. On the motion, this house believes that China should compensate its neighbors for causing environmental damages in their territories. So just to check, opening government, Vien Ant. Opening opposition, HKU1. Closing government, water debaters. And closing opposition, KU1. Yep. That's all right. All right. Then without any further ado, I call upon the Prime Minister, Taeyong Chen, to begin the debate. There you are. Mr. Speaker, when we talk about environmental issues, China seems to be the problem. We believe that in a continuous context regarding Asian countries, when in a context in where China directly knows for a fact that the yellow dust is going to affect every single country around them, including Korea, including Japan, when that yellow dust is not compensated and is intentionally being left alone for the Gobi Desert to continuously desertificate the entire country, we believe that China actually does have a moral responsibility, a moral obligation, and a willingness to actually compensate these people in their own neighboring countries. Therefore, if China actually creates the Three Gorges Dams, and if that dam actually goes to block and actually floods their southeastern countries, we believe that that is the moment where China actually has a responsibility and a moral obligation to compensate these people. Therefore, opening government is going to prove to you two things. First of all, we're going to prove to you when compensation is actually needed and legitimized based upon the clear standards that we actually use in the current in the current international society. And we're also going to prove to you about how this is a particular, a special, very delicate period on how this is actually going to lead to a lot of abuse if we do not actually meet the standards that we have in today's society. Therefore, without any further ado, let's go into my first argument about when do we actually compens when compensate is compensation is needed and when it is actually legitimized. We have three main criteria on when we can actually compensate somebody, Mr. Speaker. The first criteria is when the intention is very, very clear when that country who's actually doing that pollution actually deliberately allows that pollution to continuously go on. The second criteria is that when there's a cause and link between the perpetrator who has committed those harms and the people who have actually received those harms. And third of all, depending upon the degree of those harms, we believe that the compensation should also be different. But Mr. Speaker, let's get the context very, very clear. This isn't a debate about how much money China should actually give to South Korea or Japan. We don't think that this is a debate about that. I'm glad that everyone can see this. This is a moral principle debate about whether China should actually have the capacity or have whether they have the moral obligation to give that. On, on side of opening government, we believe that they have a clear intention and a clear need to do that. So without any further ado, let's go into my first criteria about the intention and why the intention is actually very, very clear. We believe that in the context in China, China actually knows the clear consequences of what will actually happen with their mass amount of development and with their mass amount of infrastructure being created in the Chinese context. However, despite all those facts, they are continuing to do these kind of development despite the fact that global warming is going to kill us once in a time, I, 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 like one day at the end of the day. We give you the clear example of the Gobi Desert and saying that the yellow dust is basically a clear harm to South Koreans and how respiratory diseases are actually increasing day by day in the current status quo. But it's not necessarily China who's actually planting those trees and trying to prevent that yellow dust from coming into our own country, but rather it is Korea, it is rather Japan. The people who are actually actively doing those kinds of like protections and trying to implement those kinds of trees. China clearly knows those kinds of harms, but they deliberately leave that alone. We believe that even in the case of the Three Gorges stamps, China clearly knew the intention and the direct harm of what will occur if the Three Gorges stamps actually went down and uh, when the Three Gorges stamps actually went to plug. But the most important thing, Mr. Speaker, is that the Three Gorges stamps did go to plug and with the massive amount of flooding that happened in the, in the neighboring countries, that is the moment where the neighboring countries actually had the direct harm, their actual homes were actually flooded, their like, like places where they actually grew crops actually get flooded, and they actually had a direct like like destruction of the lifestyles that they actually had. Therefore, we believe that there was a clear intention for uh, second, but second of all, regarding intention, we believe that like China is actually morally vacuous regarding their ideas. Because obviously the opposition side is going to come up and say, oh, China invests in a lot of alternative energy, China invests in all of these other areas, why do they have to compensate them? Here's the clear reason upon why they do have to compensate them. And the reason is because they actually, they're very, they're moral, uh, they have a moral double standard. Why is that? Because they're investing in money and a lot of alternative energy. We're going to concede to that point. But because they're actually investing in a lot of alternative energy, that is why their justification actually 
increases upon the legitimization of their pollution. Because fundamentally, if you say that even if I pollute a lot in the global society, because I'm investing in alternative energy, my pollution is actually legitimized because I'm trying to do something about it. Mr. Speaker, we believe that the environmental issues is not something that can only be restricted in that kind of context. Even if in, like China is like in, like even if China is actually investing in a lot of alternative energy. We still believe that if there is a clear harm, then obviously China has a moral obligation to invest and actually compensate for those harms because fundamentally there was an intention to cause those harms because fundament because at the end of the day, those kinds of benefits are actually derived only to China and not other neighboring countries. So let's go on to my second criteria before I go on any points. Sir, so your entire premise lies on the case, on the assumption that China, only China is benefiting from its own development, but other countries does not benefit, but it is not the case. So when other countries also benefit, why do other countries not need to pay the responsibility? Okay, so Mr. Speaker, like the context of today's debate about what happens in China in their own inter internal territory. Obviously, we all agree to the fact that China actually goes into other countries and they actually create a lot of like development and they actually create a lot of infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. But fundamentally, those kinds of infrastructure were created by China. But we believe that that kind of case is actually out of the context of the debate because this debate is clearly about what happens in China and what kind of development it happens in the territory of China, Mr. Speaker, and if those kinds of harms actually exceed and actually harm other countries, that is the moment where China should actually compensate for those ideas. Let's go into my second criteria, which is the cause and link. Mr. Speaker, I think I've already talked a lot about why there's a direct harm, I like why direct cause, because, <coughs> because, like, because China is the one that actually creates those factories, China is the one that pollutes the water and actually leads people to actually get more water pollution. China is the person who actually explicitly explicit, silly gives those harms, and therefore because the harms are actually very, very big, that is why China should actually give those fundamental ideas. So let's go to my third criteria about the degree of the harms, and we believe that the degree of the harms are extremely very, very big. The reason why I'm coughing right now is because I'm in a very new environment, because the Chinese air is actually very, very bad. Because the respiratory diseases that are increasing 55% compared to two years ago, we believe that that is the kind of idea, that that kind of pollution that comes from the yellow dust, comes from the factories, comes from all of the industrial revolution, and the development that came from that own mainland idea. So therefore, we believe that that kind of harm actually does exist. And because the dams actually crashed, and because flooding actually went into another neighboring country, because those people are unable to create homes, because those people are unable to create crops, that is the moment where those people actually get their lifestyles completely destroyed. When those lifestyles are destroyed, and when China does not do anything about that, we believe that that is a clear harm within itself. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, is that this damage and this pollution is not only restricted to China, but it is also restricted on a global level. It is actually restricted to, it is also going into their neighboring countries. And therefore, if those kinds of harms actually go to neighboring countries, and if those harms actually go to other countries at the end of the day, then fundamentally the harms actually do exist, the harms are intentional, and the harms actually are very, very big. Compensation is actually fundamentally needed, because at the end of the day, these neighboring countries, when we look into the characteristics, they are not in the best capacity to actually bring about the best infrastructure. They cannot create the fundamental barriers to prevent the three gorgeous dams from flooding your own country. Because the capacity and the infrastructure is not as big and not as great compared to the country of China. That is why China should be the one that actually helped because they were the ones who actually intended to do that and because they are the ones who can do it. I thank the Prime Minister for his speech and now to begin the case for the opposition side, I call upon the leader of the opposition, Alex. Ladies and gentlemen, I was born in the United Kingdom and when I went back to Hong Kong because of the polluted air from China, I suffered from asthma. But do I think that the Chinese go government should pay me back because of the suffering? No, I believe not. Because the burden is not only on the government and because I realize the fact that I'm benefiting from China's development. This is the principle we on opposition stand today. What we, in my speech, I will tell you is firstly I will dissect the, the idea of moral blameworthiness and secondly I will tell you how today's policy will substantially harm the development of China in my partner's speech he will further tell you how this harm will be uh, further to the neighboring countries and how why do you think that today's policy is essentially a policy that will drag the whole Asian Asian region down 
But before that, some rebuttals to the Prime Minister's speech, which is full of a certain number of rates. So firstly, it's about China, China's intention to harm, because in his characterization, in his justification for compensation, he says that there's a clear intention to harm the other party. We say that that intention doesn't exist in the very first place, Point, because when you think that because of his characterization, this environmental problem is worth in China's territory. We say that the Chinese government won't want to harm anybody because Sorry. Chinese citizens will be at the first front of such harming effect. So we say that that intention doesn't exist in the very first place. We, just, we say that that is some of the necessary costs we have to pay for development, which I will be further explaining in my speech. <coughs> and secondly, it's about the moral double standard he accused us of the Chinese government being. Because like we are saying that on one hand we are polluting and on the other we are doing all the sustain, sustainable development and we are justifying ourselves. That gives rise to the moral, moral double standard. We said that isn't really an argument in itself. What, what, the, what the Prime Minister should be telling is why this compensation in this form will actually help Asia region into a more sustainable development, more sustainable football. But what we in the what we on opposition say that it's nothing but a whole fatal blow to the whole economic development. And what we say that is we do recognize the problem the problem of say like global warming and all these environmental issues. But what we see is that we should work together and find a better solution instead of blaming each other and seeking for compensation which is mutually harm to each other. And so on to my substantive point about the moral blameworthiness. So we first have to look at the mode of development of China in this place. Why is China developing in such a place which gives rise to the to the like the desert desertification and also the Sir. construction of free Georgia? We see that it's not only because the Chinese government need to feed its own citizens, it's also because it's responding to the need of the neighboring region and the international stage. Why, why does the economy go on a specific path? Because there must be a demand. And we recognize that there is a demand globally, regionally, for China's cheap export. And because of China's unique place in this product, production chain in the global scale and regional scale, Sir. we say that, we say that on all these neighboring countries, once they are benefiting from China's cheap export, they should not solely blame China in this case. Don't you agree closer? No, we can't. Okay. When we're talking about other countries benefiting, yes, for sure, they enjoy yeah, yeah. these things. But when the harm and the costs are not accounted for, here, you see here. the profit being accounted and the harm not accounted, how are you going to say we that, say that we, we say that it's not only these neighboring countries which are suffering from China. The Chinese citizens are also suffering in that sense. But what we see is that we, as the, we, as the Asian people, we are taking all these benefits and harm together as a region. If the government really recognized that these benefits are we enjoying together? Then we also think that on the principal ground, they should not be so moral double standard and saying that only China you should pay the responsibility in such yeah, mode yeah. of development when they recognize that they are benefiting oh, from Chinese development. Sit down, sir. Secondly, we what we say is that today's policy is not really doing a job in helping the environment or is a we are like. Asking China to compensate in, in this form doesn't really mean that, okay, we are all heading to a better direction. What we see is that it's only adding this extra burden on China, which is Sir. harming China's economy in the first place. And in my final speech, I will tell you how this harming yeah. effect will lead to the, uh, what will make life for <coughs> other neighboring countries more difficult. No more POIs from this point onwards. So what we see is that th th while the Prime, Prime Minister do say that because today is a principal debate, we are not going to talk about how the amount of compensation. But what we do recognize is that what, whichever party who is paying the compensation, the, produ pr the producer, the companies will eventually have to pay the cost because even if it's the government paying that compensation, it will increase more tax and the eventually all these will fall onto the heavier burden on the producer and companies part. We said that is bad for China. No more POI has said that already, so sit down. So what we see today is that when you add this extra burden, then how, how is it going to affect, how is the trickle effect going to affect average citizens and affect the uh, economic development? We said that we, 
when China its economy is so heavily relying on export on foreign export exports to other countries, then we say that this mode of production and this mode of development and also the environmental cost related to it is also it plays a really substantial part in all these companies' calculation. And when you are adding this such a substantial burden, I assume because of the related moral blameworthiness, when you are we are, when you are adding the substantial burden onto these companies, onto these individual producers on their part, we're saying that you are in, in fact increasing the price for every daily commodity that China produces. We say that this is actually adding more burden to citizens and adding more burden to other neighboring countries. But more importantly, we ask the opening government, how will all this compensation actually lead to a better world? How will all this compensation, apart from all these blaming games, how will this actually help us to go into a better mode of direction? That is the burden they fail to prove. But what we on close on opposition brings to you to the table is the immediate harm to the society, to the economic development. And what we think is eventually counterproductive in today's policy is that because China is in effect supporting and trading with many of these neighboring countries. When you consider the very fact that China is the largest trading partner with many of these neighboring countries in like in the not just in export and import, but also in like the trade of raw materials production and all these, we're saying that Given adding such a burden on China's economy is not really in the best interest of neighboring or these neighboring countries. My partner will further give you a detailed analysis on this. So what have we on opening opposition brought to you to the table is, firstly, we have to recognize that China is not the party who is solely to be blamed in today's policy. And we say that when every, every neighboring country, when they are benefiting from all this mode of development, then we say that we as a region, we have to bear this consequence together and not take this consequence. And secondly, we brought to you the substantial harm brought by today's policy, which is dragging the whole region's economy down. We are very proud to oppose. Thank you. Very good. the leader of the opposition for his speech and now to continue the debate for the government side on the DPM Yongchun. Sure, sure. Thank you, Mr. Were to describe the opening opposition would be selfish, right? Yeah, because yeah. what they're doing today is when they talked about the idea of how the price of the commodity is going to increase, how China needs to prioritize development, and how this development is so important to China. First of all, they were saying that like the price of coffee and whether people can purchase coffee for a well, dollar and two dollars is more important than the lives that are being sacrificed in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. in countries like Bangladesh, or in countries like South like South Korea is more important. We think this is fundamentally wrong. They simply cannot take the moral high ground in this uh, debate. But yeah, secondly, yeah. we still think that even under that kind of assumption, it, what they're trying to propose simply isn't factually true. Because when you look at the status quo, we think the Chinese products are still going to be cheap, even if they give that, that kind of compensa compensation. Because even when China, <coughs> China actually invests on those kind of green technology, even if China invests on those kind of different things, because the Chinese labor is so cheap, because there are so much foreign direct investment in China, we think they're still going to have that kind of cheap labor. We think the product coming from China is still going to be cheap. We don't think that kind of harm actually comes from the opposition side. The kind of ideas that I'm going to be talking about in my substantive is the idea of, of right to develop your country, and second, the idea of incentive. But before doing that, I want I have two points of responses. First is the, their idea of saying that you know China already has that incentive to protect their uh, you know own citizens. We think I have three responses to this. First of all, we think this is simply not true because as my prime minister clearly told you, the kind of diseases 
actually increased 80% from 2008. We think that China, as a country itself, actually prioritizes the kind of national benefit that can actually come from that kind of having development or those kind of national policies, rather than priori prioritizing the kind of individual benefits that Chinese citizens can actually gain. So we think this is actually not true. But second, even if this is actually true, we think that that kind of benefit actually does not extend to citizens of other nations. We think that it only exists to protect those kind of citizens of China we think this is morally wrong. We also think that it's practically wrong. But if, uh, in the, my last level of analysis uh, reason, which is also an even if case, is even if all those kind of intentions actually are not there, we think that the most important thing that was given by my given by my prime minister is the kind of degree of harm that actually comes from these environmental pollution that China carries out. We think that especially in the context that we set out, in the case of yellow dust, but especially in the case of that kind of dam that we talked about, we think that countries in Southeast Asia simply don't have the capacity to take care of the kind of pollution that is being caused in their nation, and their citizens are left there to be harmed by this kind of uh, things here, here. that China actually carries out. But my second rebuttal that I want to engage with. There was their kind of idea that's going to come from their next speaker, but I'm being preemptive, and the kind of idea that other countries also benefit from China's development. Oh. We think first of all, I have two responses. We think first of all, <coughs> under the context that we set out of this debate, we think this is not true. Because when you look at the context, you know, we see these Chinese labor going to other countries, we see American companies coming into China, but we don't see people from South Korea or people from Japan actually going to China, China to work or provide any kind of labor there because the Chinese already have enough labor for that kind of cheap labor, right? But we also think that kind of like things like yellow dust or the kind of dams that we talked about, that simply doesn't have any kind of benefit to other kind of nations. We really don't see how they can actually say that it benefits other countries. But secondly, even if those kind of benefits all stand, we don't think it's mutually exclusive from the kind of policy that we want to carry out. Because what we're trying to do is we think that like even if we carry out this kind of policy, China is going to still continue that development. And if China continues the development, the Chinese citizens are going to benefit from that development. And other countries are also going to benefit from that development because oh, just because we carry out this policy, companies are suddenly not going to close down, right? We think that it's actually a different problem of like whether China actually has the moral duty to compensate to these nations or not. But having cleared up all, all those kind of rebuttals, I want to move into my own substantive, which is really important, which also engages with, with directly with the kind of idea that came from the leader of opposition. First, in talking about the right to development and to prioritize that kind of benefit. I first tell you that the right to development is not an absolute value, which was the kind of assumption that came from the leader of opposition. You think there are always restrictions, whether you look at it from the domestic perspective or international perspective. The kind of parallel example that I want to give to you from the domestic level is the idea of companies. We think companies are actually very similar to the idea on the international level, China, because they have that kind of selfish interest to prioritize the profit that they're going to get. But we think the, the reason why China is even more serious and there is more reason to actually restrict China is because in a, like a context of anarchy, where you, don't, you simply don't have the government to regulate those things, it's even harder to regulate when those kind of harms occur, and therefore there is more reason to actually create that system of regulation. We think that like this harm theory actually applies to this idea. On a domestic level, the reason why we can actually restrict these companies in following the anti-dumping law, or following making them follow certain environmental pollution regulations, is because they actually cause those kind of third party harm to individuals, or third party harm to the environment, etc. We think yeah. this kind of idea should be extended to the idea that we're debating on, on a more global level. We think that that kind of freedom to be benefit or profit is less important than the kind of harm that they're actually creating to these third parties, not only in China, but also in those other kind of countries. We think they have actually the higher moral duty, and we think China is actually not carrying <coughs> this out. But moving on into my second point of um, substantive argument, I, we think that this debate is actually a debate about comparison. So that's exactly what I'm going to give to you. Here, we think here. it's about comparing the kind of incentive China is going to have before and after we take this policy out. We think that China is going to actually have a bigger incentive, like to, uh, depending on the, depending on whether they actually have the duty to compensate or not. Because now what is happening is, you know, you know how China, China has all this land, all these people, and therefore a lot of foreign direct investment actually come into China. Therefore, they really want to develop a lot in their country. They have this kind of incentive to, you know, even though they create some kind of environmental pollution, they want to prioritize the kind of development that's going to happen. We think they also, you know, don't have that kind of incentive to stop these kind of uh, pollution from happening.
happening because that's clearly what they're they're doing in terms of the yellow dots, and they're not building the trees. South Korea actually has to come in to, to build the trees for them, right? But we think in this kind of situation, the interest to only get more benefit exists rather than to in minimize the kind of harm that's going to come from the kind of actions China is carrying out those kind of things. We think that that kind of incentive is only going to stand under our policy because now when they actually have to compensate, what's going to happen is they actually have the incentive to a block or minimize the kind of monetary deficit that is going to occur under our model. We think now what's going to happen is they're actually going to put in some effort to, like, because it directly um, contradicts with the kind of interest that they have in gaining more monetary profit, they're actually going to put in some effort to restrict or minimize the kind of damages that are going to happen. We, I give you another, like, uh, again, the example of companies on a more domestic level. The reason why companies actually are careful of those kind of environmental issues or those kind of you know, regulations is because they know that they have to compensate whenever they cause some kind of damage to individuals or they know that there are going to be sin tax for whatever kind of pollution or envir environmental damage they cause up. That's the reason why they have the incentive to minimize the kind of harm. We think the same logic applies to the kind of context that we're talking about in China, but an even bigger like moral duty actually applies because we're talking about a more global level and the harm is much, much bigger. That's why we're very happy to propose. So Mr. Speaker, before I move on to my substantive argument, I have two points on reputations. First, re first point of reputation, on the point of how the model can increase the incentive for China to have to develop cleaner energy. So we say that under even under the status quo, we already see the Chinese government has been investing quite a lot in clean energy and try to minimize the pollution that it actually caused to the people and caused to neighboring country. And it's also in the mandate and also in the mission statements of the government of the Chinese government quite recently to always stress on developing on clean energy and try to minimize minimize all these pollutions. So we don't see there's a quite an actual problem that this side of this side of the house actually will solve by the model. But more importantly is the is the major point or the only important point being that it is actually more morally blameworthy of, of on the part of China. That's why China has to pay. So we all understand that uh, compensation is a, is a process of allocating blame. And this side of the house tried to tell us that it is only China who is, a, who is the wrongdoer. That's why China ha must pay all the responsibility. We say that it is fundamentally wrong. I think my partner has amply told you how all the other countries, for example, Southeast Asian countries, they also benefit from the development of China. For example, they have been, they have been hugely benefited from buying a lot of cheap exports, which is the product of China development. We say that actually their, their demand for Chinese, Chinese de development is also a cause, not, may not be a direct cause, but also an indirect cause that actually cause that actually produces all this kind of pollution. So we say that all these Soviet Asian countries also have a role and also have a responsibility to play in the, in, in the damages so. for environment. So that's why the Deputy <coughs> Prime Minister has already not mentioned Soviet Asian countries. When we actually tell you how these Soviet Asian countries actually are benefiting and therefore morally they should so. also pay. And on the other hand, they try to like divest out uh, attention by saying that okay now what South uh, South Korea or Japan we also say that like South Korea and Japan are also a huge buyer of Chinese products right they also have been benefiting from a lot of development of China right so we say that their demand for Chinese development is also a cause for the de for the pollution caused by China so we don't see why that the whole blameworthiness should also should only be put uh, on China don't you agree? You think that when you moment that you say that you use like investing on green technology as a legitimacy that be only becomes a justification for further damage and further environmental Shame. pollution. You think that's morally bad? No. First of all, we see that China has a determination to cut pollutions and it is clearly in the government like how the government wants to do any governmental plan. And second of all, we say that we say that 
Building green technology is a common responsibility if in every country because we are in a globalized world and their connected, their development, their actions of development actually affect each other. So it is not only which state's responsibility to do that. It is a shared, it, it should be an equal sharing of responsibility across all countries. That's why we say that it is fundamentally wrong to only put the blameworthiness on China. So, that, so why it is absolutely like needed or necessary to make sure who actually bear the, risk, the uh, blameworthiness. Because we say that when the countries have also, have always, ha have consistently put in the blame solely on China, they are trying to they are sending a very strong <coughs> message to the government, to the people that these surrounding countries actually do not have a role to play. This minimizes their incentive to actually collaborate with China to, to develop further on green technology. And also, Increase the, inter uh, increase the collaboration on an international level to actually fight this problem together because this is the problem, this is the responsibility shared by all the countries in the first place. That's why we say that the whole premise on their case, which is China has a sole blame to play, to, uh, to bear, actually is false, and then their case entirely, is entirely not standing. So now on my constructive argument, which they have largely not engaged with, or a one-liner engagement, so they simply say that, okay, now, what? We see that the compensation is not actually very substantial. So the companies will not shut down, and then the, pro the products can still be cheap. It is what they, it is direct, it is direct quote from the deputy prime minister. But we say that it is a sort of contradictory, right? So they are trying to characterize that like the harm caused by China, so-called caused by China, is that is very substantial. So if it is really that substantial, the compensation this side of the house is actually demanding from China will also be hugely substantial, right? So we don't see why it will not be an impediment on Chinese products and Chinese economy. So in my Fourth following mission. part of my speech, I'm going to constructively tell you why n is it not only harm China itself, but also harm impact the neighboring countries in terms of their economic development. So I have two supports going to tell you. First of all, I'm going to tell you how the process of development, and second of all, I'm going to not 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 at this time. Second, I'm going to tell you how it impacts the developed economic development of the surrounding countries. First of all, we say that a lot of Southeast Asian countries, which under today's context are also relevant, are at a very embryo, embryonic stage of development. So what they need to do is to, they are trying to sell more like cheap products and including China, right? So why, so China, the purchasing power of Chinese people is very important in this case. So when we say that the model is putting a huge burden on the Chinese companies, which directly like <coughs> hampers the export of China, which is the fundament that supports China's economy, there's a huge impact on Chinese economy in the first place. So the following concept Consequences is that it will impact the national income of the Chinese people. Chinese people. We say that it is very detrimental. Why? Because China is Wait, not sir. only a huge exporter, but also a huge buyer, right? So Chinese people have been buying also quite a lot of different products from these Southeast Asian countries, these countries that are relevant in today's context. When we say that the purchasing power of Chinese, like Chinese people actually is lowered by their model su quite substantially, we say that it also impacts the development of these Southeast Asian countries. When these Southeast Asian countries cannot further benefit from their own exports, they cannot gather the necessary assets that they need to further development. People cannot like increase their income. People cannot further to migrate to another stage of economic development by like gathering their income for, for long-term investment, for example, education, and migrate to a higher social status. We said it is extremely harmful in this uh, today's <coughs> globalized world, where a model that apparently only affects one country actually has a huge impact or, or, or a sweeping impact also on all the other countries in the neighboring world. So not to forget that when these neighboring countries also are in a very early stage of de development, we say that they require China has a good economy, hence has a high purchasing power to buy their product so that these uh, neighboring countries, the Southeast Asian countries, can also develop and migrate to another state. So, so for all the above reasons, please go for the opposition. Thank you.
From closing down inside, we believe this debate is much more than a simply economic debate. Before we go into our uh, extension about geopolitical issues surrounding China and why China has a unique interest in compensating countries around them in order to get better international atmosphere for Chinese agenda, we want to actually put a stop to these ch discussion about economic liability or economic benefits. And eventually, my, my speech will be divided into these two parts. Right? The first part about economic issue, second part about geopolitical issue. So economic issues. right? When we discuss about the harms and benefit that was like seen, that we see in this discussion, we need to first understand something is changing in our world. We see globalization, right? Globalization doesn't happen only in trade. It also happens in air pollution. When air pollution and a lot of these pollution doesn't only stay in your own country anymore, it's spread outside and harms other countries. This now nullifies the old concept of our sovereignty, right, of our territory. Because it's not, oh, no longer about your country, you take care of your own country anymore. It's about you also need to take care of all the pollution that cause harm to another country. Your pollution goes to another country, that is also what you cause. But let's take a look at what are these like issues that were at stake, right? Opening opposition said, but other countries also benefited from Chinese cheap products and stuff, right? We agree. But there's some, so much of a hidden cost that you didn't account for, right? Where our opening government side was telling you that there was this like cause for your diseases and stuff, right? We want to tell you also that when other countries need to compete with your cheap labor, need to compete with your like producing with an environmental pollution, what happens is that we are now in a race to the bottom. How is your own country's producer who produce ethical products, right? Not polluting your country, not polluting anything, going to compete with you? Chinese market, they're taking away your employment job opportunity, right? Not only than that, right, when you're talking about Southeast Asian company, they're also producing. We see these up and coming countries, they have to be reduced to a status where they also need to pollute as well, <coughs> where they also need to yeah, get yeah. cheap labor and actually suffer huge costs simply because they can't compete with the Chinese producers in the very first place. We say when China lowers the standard for environment, it's not only harming like in terms of disease, it's not only harming in terms of those who are ill are not those who are actually consuming these products. Even though your consumer gets the benefit, those who got the disease wasn't really enjoying that benefit in the first place. But more than that, we see also other producers at stake. We see a race to the bottom. But that's also more than this race to the bottom, right? If we go down even one more level, we see that because Chinese people inherently suffering from a lot of bad living conditions in the very first place, they were not having the same kind of environmental standard in their own idea than countries around China, than your neighboring country. What happened is that Chinese government is effectively using like environmental pollution as a bargaining chip to take hostage of other countries to come in and help, which is exactly what the opening opposition was arguing. We need international collaboration on developing technology and alternative energies. <coughs> yes, exactly. Why other countries have to come in? Because they have no way to solve their problem, no way to stop their own people from getting disease, from getting health problems. How should they do so? The only way is to actually go to China and say, we give you aid to build forests, we give you aid for alternative energy, we need you to do so. We are now essentially taking advantage of other countries' benefit in order to protect that environment, <coughs> and that is not fair in the Sorry. very first place. Before I move on, yes. Under your logic, then all these improvements bring by these foreign companies will not only benefit Chinese citizens, but also the citizens from those countries. So these countries, these aids, are actually paying the cost for the benefits they got from China in the first place, and also benefiting their own citizens. What I'm telling you is that even though there might be a benefit, given these hidden costs, which is not the same as the benefit you get, we are not really able to compare these issues. Yeah. This is the same reason why we need to have anti-dumping like policies, why we need to have actually like, like environmental pollution tax and stuff, right? like carbon tax, for example, yeah. right? to be imposed. Be exactly the reason. You need to account for the hidden costs so that people can realize that, and China can change its way to develop, and that would also help other producers as well. Right? But eventually, going to geopolitical issue, right? when we're talking about Japanese people, being forced to come to China, South Korean people being forced to come to China, offer aid, like build forests, we need you to stop environment. We also see something very interestingly happen coincidentally, right? 
Surrounding China, we have more, many, many neighboring countries. We don't see China as a good old, like weak country anymore. We see China as an emerging power. We see more and more of a tangible threat from China. When China and Japan is having this territorial dispute over Diaoyu Island, when China and Philippines is having this territorial dispute with Huangyan Island, we see also like with other territorial dispute over like Indonesia, like with Vietnam, with Philippines, we solve <coughs> a problem here, right? China needs stability for continuous economic development, needs stability to stop war from happening, stop conflict from happening, to have normalized trade relations, for example, with Japan, with South Korea. What happened in here? Does China have a real interest in maintaining these kind of interests, right? But what happens now is that when my upper house, right, people from Korea, accuse China in saying that, well, we have disease that's caused by China, we see increasing hostility, right, which was exactly presented by opening government. When they say, you have the blame, you need to take care of that. Right? How are we going to make sure that normalized trade relations and how can we make sure that actually better bilateral like, relation in terms of people <laughs> understanding each other could happen? The way is that China needs to initiate some goodwill. Right? When other countries see China as an emerging power, when others see China economic growing stronger and stronger, when other countries do understand that China is not as poor as before, and China was not as incapable of taking care of their own issues and like as, as much as before, we say China needs to offer their helping hand. Why is that geopolitical issue even more important to China? Is that when you see it's not only about territorial dispute, with other countries. China even faced other even more important agenda, for example, e reunifying Taiwan Island or like talking about these special administrative region like Hong Kong, Macau and everything. Right? <laughs> so this whole reunification, which was the ultimate government mission, right? That was also at stake. What if like other neighboring countries was intervening in China reunif the process of China reunifying Taiwan, etc., etc. We say this whole international environment, this getting clear international recognition <coughs> in Chinese legitimacy in trading, in having bilateral ties with other countries, is very important. We take this debate because we understand the real issue. Thank the member of the government for his speech, and now to continue the debate for the opposition side, member of opposition. <laughs> So far, our opening opposition has talked about the practical issues about how compared to um, uh, compared to opening opposition, which have talked about the net benefit when it comes to economic development, we were actually diverged into more uh, not the practical issues, but more the principal issues as to why China shouldn't do it, as to why China shouldn't be the government to do it. So we will first rebut to their arguments, and then we believe in this motion there are three burdens proof that harms do exist, which has been proven, which we concede to, but debate more about then who's really responsible for it, who should compensate for it, and what should the Chinese government do in this scope of debate. So we're going to provide you analysis on all these points. Now, let's move on to the, what the opening government has provided to you today, Mr. Speaker. They talk about <coughs> legitimacy on three criteria. First, intention, cause of relationship, and degree of harm. We believe that yes, there is up to a certain amount of harm being done because of what's happening inside of China, that other countries face. Here, here. But when it comes to intentions, we have two levels of response. For one thing, come on, it's for development economic benefit. When China, when they're going to sign, you know, hmm, I'm going to harm Korea. You know what? Taeyong and are making, uh, are making cough, I'm going to develop, you know, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no, there's no intention, as in the intention role for military. Um, <coughs> and of course, when it comes to, for example, their analysis of free border sale, it's an accident for Christ's sake. It's an unpredictable thing. Why should there be an intention in it? And when it comes to causal relationship, then it's about the, what kind of actors have done this man. What kind of actors then should compensate for it? 
So this is going to be provided. It's going to really contribute to the hopes of Christian. Really, it's not actually the government. Burdening the government is extremely unfair in that sense because we believe it's more in the private sphere of the debate. More information. Now, so, quote by quote from the opening government, China is the person in power. We don't believe that this character in China as a person is a fair thing. We're going to uh, diverge more into how the economy works, how the private companies are the ones that actually have to compensate for it. Second of all, when they talk about possibility of abuse, because you know you're restricting, uh, you have to restrict China because of principles. First of all, on international level, it's all on mutual consensus. So we believe that your analysis doesn't stand in this case, and it's relevant to this issue. But also, and moreover, and more importantly, we say that this kind of possibility of views only exists when China's government is the, sole per, uh, is the main perpetrator of this, which are the truth, in my extension. And then the closing government comes out, gives us a geopolitical <coughs> issue about you know what China should do. This will be actually integrated into my second. Point, sir. No, thank you. Second uh, analysis about what's really good for China and what will happen to it if we allow this to happen. Uh, yes. So we have two stages. First of all, let's talk about clarification of the perpetrator. And second of all, I'm going to talk about role of the government. What should the Chinese government do? And what should it prioritize over any other thing? No, thank you. First of all, clarification of perpetrator. Why is it a wrongly placed burden that have been done on the government side? We believe that all through the opening house and through you know, the closing government, there was no characterization of who's really doing the government. We believe that it's not China as a person, because they say China, China, China. It's the enemy, it's the multinational corporations that's mainly at fault here. China has opened up a lot during this age of globalization. It is the multinational corporations that come in and do the development. It is them who are uh, who are creating the CLL dust. And we believe that, as I said before, them are not relevant to this issue because it's excellent, no intention, so it fails. So but also, we believe that so. they are run by the board of directors, they are multinational corporations, which means that you can't really burden the individuals of Chinese citizens. Because yeah. in essence, what it means to pay, make the government pay is that you're making the taxes that the citizens, yeah. in order to pay, pay for it. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are Chinese here, but our average Joe, who has nothing <coughs> to do with this kind of economic development, who has nothing to do with yellow dust, who has nothing to do with this kind of poor, uh, pollution caused by the economic development that the open government is so worried about, has to pay for what the companies did, what the board of directors and what the CEO has decided upon. We think that they are the real perpetrators, and you are no. You are wrongly characterizing the perpetrators, and you are wrongly shifting the burden onto the government, onto its own individual citizens. Now you are trying to. Okay, so the tax of the Chinese citizens shouldn't uh, shouldn't be spent on the people. Uh, for, uh, the tax of the Chinese people shouldn't be spent on something that they had nothing to do with in the first place. And I think it's me. the Chinese government directly knew the harms of what would happen once the three gorgeous stamps actually goes to plop. It went to plop. They knew the consequences, but they neglected those kinds of harms. We believe that in the three gorgeous cases, in the case. There was no intention to harm Sir. the citizens in the first place. So you believe that your case fails. I will explain more on the role of government. So fine, there are clashing values in this debate, as there always should be in the debate, Mr. Speaker. But what none of us actually explained so far is what the government, what China, should prioritize over any other thing. We believe that for the role of the government, for the proper government, is the most uh, the most priority, the first and foremost priority lies in its own national interest. How to best take care of its own people. Why has the USA not signed the Kyoto Protocol? Because it's being a responsible government in that sense. The, the motion is that this house believes that China should, right? So we're going to prove why China shouldn't do it. Now, let's talk about the actual analysis, which is really a okay, contribution coming from causing opposition. What happens to China after it pays? Now, two, uh, two, uh, two things happen on the case of China. First of all, there's the financial loss of this because of the fact that yeah. damages are very yeah. perpetual when it comes to foreign yellow dust. You're not going to stop it within a few days just because it's half development. So it's a very yeah. long term effect, meaning that there will be huge financial loss on the part of China. Now, this is a heavy burden. Not only is it justifiable, but it's, all, it's going to be burdening China, so that China would lose incentive to do it, unlike what they say. And second, when they talk about geopolitical and engaging you right now, they are diplomatically <coughs> weakened because you're taking the wrong burden, which shouldn't be done, uh, which shouldn't be dealt with you in the international political arena. It's very important at this consistency on justification. When people wrongly accuse a government and you give in, saying, oh, fine, it's not a fault, but we will give in and we'll do this, it's much harder for you to forward other agendas, like, you know, Taiwan, Hong Kong, whatever. 
uh, islands, whatever. Because of the fact that now you have a burden, you are on the more low ground. When you have, clearly have more high ground, because again, the government wasn't the specific people who were responsible for it. Again, the people shouldn't be the ones having the burden to pay for the multinational corporations who don't do it. So therefore, the Chinese government, being a very responsible government, should not, in fact, take care of, uh, should not put itself in this kind of position where it's actually discriminating, uh, discrediting itself, where it's actually bad for them in a clear manner, so it's way more disincentive, uh, disincentive on your side of the house. So, being a responsible one, taking up national interest <coughs> first, taking up justification, thinking about whether it's justification, then Chinese government, in fact, shouldn't go along with this motion. So, because we have proven to you on a principal level why Chinese government shouldn't do it, what it actually should do, and where the perpetrator lies in the case of environment damages, we take the debate home, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member of the opposition for his speech. And now to conclude the case from the government side, I'd like to call upon the whipsmith. Okay, for, it is okay for 
the government to make decisions for the Chinese people, even though we don't think it's that fair enough, both for the Chinese people. Second is about the um, second is about the citizens. Um, the proposition, the opposition side, consistently telling us that there is a demand for development from other countries because they buy our cheap products. The problem is that. China is not the only country that provides cheap products in this world. Why especially China? Why they are begging us for giving the so, so. cheap man, man, man. Give, sorry, sorry, sorry. giving the cheap uh, products for them. We don't see any justification here. Go. Okay, you also know that they are substitute, but the countries still choose to buy from China and encourage Chinese development. So why these countries are not responsible in the first place? They choose to buy from China. Because China is nearer. Because we are the neighbors, because they will cost cost less in terms of geopolitical issues, which exactly wanted by <coughs> the so, so talking about the, the demand, they say they say that well, actually, people already benefited simply uh, generated by the cheap products you use. However, they never tell us well it is fair to compare well the benefits they get from the cheap products and the loses the face of in case of uh, health. In, in case of disease, are proportionate, proportionate with each other. They never provide us any kind of standard to measure that. Second, the consistent talking about this is the unfair burden for China, will raise the prices and reduce the purchasing power, etc., etc. We think that we, we question this kind of prices really happen. We think that China, the, the cheap neighbor products, already acting as a kind of comparative advantage over other people. We don't think that. But leveraging by forcing those multinational corporations will subtly increase the price so huge that you will surpass the prices of products from USA, from Japan, that people will never buy you again. Secondly, as my partner has provided to you that there are many other products, like ethical products, that China should have the incentive to develop. Once the cheap neighbor being the dominant part, people are losing the incentive to develop the ethical part. We don't think that is very beneficial for the future development for China. Secondly, talking, uh, secondly, talking about the, uh, what, what, uh, the international atmosphere we really want. We think that a, a very good relationship, a very good trading partner should have the, share the mutual trust and mutual respect with each other. Well, her, those trades or those benefits is provided by economy generated from trade, generated from the willingness to buy your products, the willingness to be the partner with you. However, China is different. When you are heavily polluting their, polluting their environment, when you are using your products to heavily harm their houses, well, this will directly cause the hostility from our countries. This will directly causing the leveling the tension between China and other neighbors. We don't think that this issue really stands. Secondly, we're talking about the reunification, a reunification of China, etc. So China now we have done a lot of bad things. The, it is now we cannot let the situation get worse. We need to, to find support. We need to find the rebuild the trust for each other, respect. We think that the moment that you choose to respect your wrongdoings for your neighbors, your neighbors will ultimately have the incentive to respect your decision and respecting the pollution that might cause it by them, like Japan's nuclear leakage. They're responsible for all kinds of stuff. We don't think that's something that only detrimental for China. We think it's a win-win solution, not only for China, but also for the whole Asia, uh, Asia spirit, uh, region. In the name of fairness, in the name of international, uh, in international atmosphere, economic trade would proud to. Thank Mr. Speaker, 
Cuddles, ladies and gentlemen, find the last round. I'm here. Seven minutes and yay, you can all go home. Okay, regarding this motion, we believe as a closing opposition, there's two main questions regarding today's debate. First of all, justification. Who's the perpetrator? Who can we actually blame the fault in all the harms that we both agreed upon? The environmental damages, whether it was spillover, whether it was directed perpetrator in their territories, who's the main perpetrator and who's to blame, who's to fault? Second, on a more trivial level, if that's really the case, if you do find someone to blame, then what are the harms and benefits coming out of it? And more explicitly, as stated by the closing government, in the perspective of China, is it really worth spending all that money? Is it really worth paying back on something whether you could or could not have done, as I would approve, I'll prove later on in my clashes, whether or not this is really beneficial or harmful regarding your own stance in the geopolitical arena, regarding economy and whatnot. So with that said, let's jump right into organizing the clashes. First of all, Point just start, start. I haven't even started yet, man. First of all, the opening government clearly contextualizes saying supposedly that China itself is. Supposedly China is the main perpetrator because they have a clear intention of harming their surrounding nations. That, okay, I will harm you, haha, -ha, but under the pretense of my selfish development. The closing government clearly gave you in our own extensions why this isn't so. Why environmental damages, whether they're spillovers or whatnot, is not the responsibility, is not the fault of the Chinese government, as stated by the motion. When you say China should pay back, you're talking about the Chinese government taking whatever budget they have and spreading it around to surrounding nations, which means you're blaming the Chinese government as a whole. Let's take a look at this in two levels. First of all, okay, so that whatever, Three Rivers Dam, whatever, and Yellow Death Desert. One thing regarding that, it's a natural disaster, even within domestic issues. When, you, when the government builds a dam, when there's a natural disaster, where, where you have low expectation regarding the building, when you have a low percentage of natural disaster happening, but it still happens, it's a freaking accident. It's not something you perpetrated. It's not something you intentionally did in order to harm your own citizens. Even in that case, when you provide support, when you provide re-sheltering and whatnot, it's not in form of compensation. It's because you do it as responsibility towards your own citizens. We see no justification coming from accidents, Point which sir. they clarified as a major example from the Chinese <coughs> government to surrounding nations. You can't calculate sir. all the possibilities. You didn't do it despite the fact there's a very high possibility of intentionally harming people, meaning the major example regarding that fails in that case. Second level. The closing government agreed that yes, it is a main, the main perpetrators are MNCs. The main perpetrators isn't the Chinese government, but it's those companies that come in and create all those harmful effects that go over the spillover effects and whatnot. We question, then why does the Chinese government have a responsibility regarding this? They say lack of control. They say lack of control is the main reason why they should pay back. We ask, does really lack of control provide you enough of justification that these not these major perpetrators, not these Point primary motion. perpetrators, but the Chinese government Sorry. has to pay back in yes. Okay. This is not disaster that we're talking about. When Chinese environmental policy caused deforestation in China, and when we know seasonal wind is blowing these deforestation be sent to other countries, the Chinese government is knowingly making the choice. Mr. Speaker, regarding the Gobi Desert, Remind me, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was an accumulation of decades. That was an accumulation of centuries of wrong policies that nobody really foresaw. And regarding that, we believe that in the status quo, when they came that the Chinese government is doing nothing regarding it, that it's the surrounding nations Sorry. having payback and whatnot, we believe this isn't simply true. Because as a sea of the pressure regarding, because of whatever sustainable and green technology, whatever going on in the international arena, that the Chinese government is indeed taking steps within their own domestic issues, Furthering that the past, the accumulation of the past Goma is not the responsibility of the current Chinese government enough to hurt <coughs> their own citizens. Second level, so coming from the closing government, so let's go back to what I was talking about. Or Same question. Question. If you kill someone, do you blame it on your, is it responsibility on your parents because they did not educate you that it was wrong to kill someone? Sorry. Rather, it is your moral obligation, especially in the case of MSCs, when they do know they have a moral so, they have a moral responsibility not to pollute, not to damage surrounding countries. It's their responsibility. They're the main perpetrators, not the Chinese government. You Point can't sir. blame them for having a lack of regulation, a lack of control. We ask you, well, we can't, they can do it anyway, but we claim that this isn't their moral justification. This isn't their moral responsibility regarding paying back. Meaning, their case fails regarding justification. So, let's go back to, if that's the case, 
if China doesn't really have a fault in this matter, what are the harms and benefits coming out of seeing that the harms and benefits of paying back isn't really mutually exclusive to considering the justifications, Sorry. considering who's to blame? So what the government side, as stated by the Korean government, because well, their whole harms and benefits trivial argument came up from that side, they simply Point, say that on two levels, economics and geopolitics. Geopolitically, they claim that all these controversies, all these conflicts with surrounding nations, but I'm not sure if they have conflicts with Hong Kong, Taiwan, those islands, I'm not sure if they threw it up. But the question is, is it really that important because you pay back environmental damages that's going to actually strengthen your position? So it's like, okay, I know we have this territorial dispute over all the Point, other important sir. geopolitical factors. I know we have dispute regarding our history and whatnot, but we give you a little bit of money, we give a large sense of hat, it's going to be solved. We believe that's not the case. Rather, coming from the closed Point, opposition sir. is rather weakening your position. When in the interest <coughs> of the Chinese government, you still have to play a strong hand considering these relationships. Uh, when it's your benefit Point. to actually try to perpetrate your influence and try not to back down and try to weaken it, you're basically backing down. You're basically disincentivizing yourself, taking the lower moral ground, saying that, okay, we didn't do it wrong, but since you advise asking to, we'll pay you anyway. You're basically taking the weaker stance, and we believe this is not in the major interest, this is not a major benefit to the Chinese government. Second level, as our member of opposition characterized, paying back environmental damage isn't like, okay, here's a million bucks, go fix it. Basically put, because of the fact that it's been going on and going on for a long, long time, you pay a substantial amount of money, as they characterize, enough to disincentivize corporates from doing whatnot. If that's a substantial amount of money, when you're not at fault, why are you burdening your own citizens? Why are you burdening your own taxpayers enough to damage, enough to claim, not provide them with the same amount of welfare, same amount of help and whatnot you could have given them through that amount of money? Mr. Jigu, let's take a very simple analogy regarding today's date. When all those oil spills happen, when ExxonMobil, uh, Bhopal, whatever, whatever happens, who actually pays for those damages? Is it the countries of those companies' origins, or is it the companies themselves? In that regard, we ask you on a major level, which actor, which stakeholder has the main responsibility, is the main perpetrator to these bait, and whether or not China is at fault? If that's the case, going on to a secondary level, what is it in the major interest of the Chinese government? With those questions in mind, closing opposition is very proud to approach. And we can go home. Yay! All right, I thank the opposition for the speaker. <coughs> and that's the end of the debate. Please shake hands and.